going to talk to you today about six things that Antichrist uh, <coughs> Christians must teach. I've seen this thing over the years, and I've seen it develop and develop and develop, that there are these people out there that call themselves Christians, and they're not true Christians. They're false converts, false brethren, as the Bible calls them. And these people have an agenda. There are basically six things that they have to teach that have to be there to help bring in their system of worshiping the Antichrist, the man of sin. I'm going to give you these six things here quickly, and then I'm going to show you the scriptures to debunk these things. Number one, faith alone as the only gospel. That's the first thing that these Antichrists have to teach. Number two, eternal security in every dispensation, especially in the uh, <coughs> tribulation. Number three, you have to go to church. I'll show you that, why they are teaching that. Uh, number four, a three-person trinity. That's going to be very important for the Antichrist and his system. I'll show you why. Number five, the reprobate doctrine, they call it. Uh, another thing that's very important to the Antichrist and his system. And of course, number six, you have to be anti-pre-trib rapture, right? Also known as the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, more properly called that. Okay, and I'm going to show you the reason why they have to keep hammering on this issue of, you know, going against the pre-trib rapture. Well, let's start out here. Faith alone as the only gospel. Why is this so important to those that are antichrists? First of all, let me show you the scripture to prove this thing. Turn in your Bible, your King James Bible, to 1 John chapter 2. You say, that doesn't make sense. How can you have an uh, antichrist Christian? Well, understand when I say Christian, I'm saying it in the sense of that's what they call themselves. Right? But they're not actually part of the body of Christ. Let me show you the scripture. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Little children, it is the last time. Certainly it is. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Okay, the Antichrist is not some kind of a political system. There is a man, the son of perdition, the man of sin. Revelation 13 talks about him uh, in great detail. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about this man of sin sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's not a political system. Okay, a lot of the Reformed theology says Antichrist is just a system of Catholicism. Um, no, not totally accurate there. Catholicism is definitely an Antichrist system, but it's going to be a man, a physical man, that gets people worshiping him. All right? That's the Antichrist that shall come. But look at this. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. You know... The closer we get to the Lord taking the body of Christ up, the rapture, there's going to be more and more antichrists showing up. How do you know what they are? They went out from us. You see, false brethren will pretend to be part of you. They'll pretend to be part of your ministry, part of your system. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. As time goes by, the true body of Christ, the Lord, it's kind of like that you can get all these little false Christians that are, that are you know, attached with their teeth and the Lord just kind of shaking and then they're falling off one at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's been a lot of issues that have come up that you'll see these people that are false, these antichrists, and they're, boy, we're with you on salvation. We're with you on the stand of the King James Bible. We're with you on the rapture issue. We're with you on creation versus evolution. We're with you on all these different things. And all of a sudden, some little pet doctrine of theirs gets kicked, and they fall back, and they say, hey, and, then, and they'll go, and they'll join the enemy, and they'll, they'll forsake all the stands that they used to take. And you think, wait a second here. <laughs> If you disagree with me on one point, why did you just drop all the other stands that you took in the past? You see? Because they're antichrists. That's the whole thing. Yes, there are people that call themselves Christians that are not really Christians. False brethren, as, as I said earlier. But let's look at this thing of faith alone. All right? It's faith alone is the only gospel. There's this new little Jesuitical sophistry that's being brought out by a lot of Baptists now. And they'll say, we are classic dispensationalists 
we teach that the gospel has always been, from Genesis to Revelation, the gospel's always been by faith alone. We're a classic dispensationalist. I showed the video. Uh, some Baptist preacher came out against the new IFB, and he said, We're, classic dispensationalism has always taught faith alone as the means of salvation from Genesis to Revelation in every dispensation. And, he, you know, I think uh, Jesuit, Jesuitical sophistry, they play little mind games, and they'll, they'll twist things, and they'll, they'll double speak. And that's what this guy did. Uh, classic dispensationalism teaches that God dealt with different people throughout these different dispensations, seven dispensations. God's dealing with people in a different way. Obviously, uh, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection wasn't available to the people in the Old Testament. That's why they were sacrificing animals. There was an element of works there in their salvation. Obviously. <laughs> okay? You didn't just say, you know, I got to go and, and uh, you know, sacrifice this lamb or whatever else. And I don't, I don't need to. I'm saved by faith alone. Uh, hey, uh, you know, we're going through Exodus right now as, as a family um, in our devotions and things. And, uh, you know, the Lord says to Moses, hey, I'm going to send the death angel. I'm going to come through and, and I'm going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. And you got to kill this, you sacrifice this lamb and put the blood on the top of the doorpost and on the sides and things. And you got to do all this stuff. Eat it. Don't leave anything till the morning and whatever. And Moses says, well, I don't really think we need to do that, Lord. We're saved by faith alone. Every dispensation, Genesis to Revelation, we're saved by faith alone. <laughs> uh, no, there's an element of works in the Old Testament. There's an element of works in the future. There are no works for salvation today. But salvation today is not faith alone either. Okay, again, you got to understand that. You, somebody says salvation has always been by, by faith alone. Look up the words faith and alone. They never appear side by side in the King James Bible. Well, salvation has always been by faith alone. Don't you think that they would appear that way in Scripture? Don't you think there'd be a verse of Scripture that says salvation is by faith alone? Uh, it's not there. You know why? Because that's not the plan of salvation at any time. I mean, think about the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. Say it that way. Um, how can you have faith alone for salvation when Jesus Christ is physically on the earth? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that. Jesus is going to be physically on the earth for a thousand years. Then you have some of these, these you know, liars out there and they'll say, well, nobody gets saved in the thousand year reign of Christ. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jesus is on the earth for a thousand years. People are being born and everything else and nobody can get saved for a thousand years. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, no. <laughs> you say, well, I, I don't understand though. You're saying salvation is not by faith alone today? Absolutely not. Grace through faith. God has to have grace for us. I'll be doing a study on this coming up here in the future, but God has grace. Okay? And we have faith. Faith alone, if you just remove God's grace out of the equation, well, faith alone is just, it's all about you. See? Faith alone is a lie. You need to understand that. Um, not only is it, you can't defend it from the Scriptures, it doesn't appear there, but I'm saying... Old Testament, they're sacrificing animals as part of their salvation. Staying right with the Lord. Okay? Um, it's not faith alone. Uh, no dispensation ever has faith alone. But you see, it's important to Antichrist Christians to get this faith alone thing in there. Why? Well, because then uh, you might be able to do some other things and just say, hey, I'm saved by faith alone. So I took the mark of the beast but I'm saved by faith alone, you see. No works attached to my salvation. I can take the mark because I have to. I have no other choice. Let me show you. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 12. What happens if you take the mark of the beast? Well, if you're saved by faith alone, not really anything. I guess just get kind of out of fellowship with the Lord a little bit. Kind of, Lord's a little bit disappointed in you or something like that. I mean... Salvation is by faith alone, right? Wrong. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Notice it says, if any man, not any lost man. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who don't have faith alone. Um, no. Who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You mean to tell me uh, faith alone isn't going to save you in that time? No, faith alone won't save you in that time. Let me show you the proof. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It isn't just the faith of Jesus. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that have the faith of Jesus. No, there's keeping the commandments of God. And the big command there is don't take that mark. If you do, instant ticket to hell. And you can't cut your hand off or some other kind of foolish nonsense like that and get out of it. Uh, later on when you're done using the mark, you know, go get your groceries and live for most of the way through the tribulation, you know, using their terms. You go through the most of the thing and then, and then at the end you kind of go, oh wait, Jesus is coming, oh, I better cut my hand off quick. You know, it, it's stupid to even think about that. I mean, this whole, this whole thing that uh, Robert Breaker and Gene Kim have come out with and, the, and we learned it from Ruckman. Well, then Ruckman was wrong. <laughs> Okay, uh, if Ruckman said that, then he was stu just as stupid as the people that repeat it. Okay, uh, we're, we, we're going to take the mark of the beast in our right hand and, oh, Jesus is coming, quick, you know, get me an axe or something and I'll chop your hand off. What are you going to do then? Do you realize how quickly you would bleed to death if you cut your hand off? Do you realize uh, amputating your own hand? We won't even get into the thing of the mark upon the forehead, you know, and how do you get that or in the forehead there. It's in and upon, in in Revelation 13, upon in Revelation 20. We'll just leave that one go. But let's just do the hand thing here for a minute. Um, you see Jesus coming, you know, whack your hand off. You'd have to have a surgical team there that would be able to carterize the, the different veins and whatever, burn them in other words. And you'd have to be able to get that whole thing covered over and whatever else and before you lose all your blood. I mean, people commit suicide by cutting their wrist. And you're going to cut your hand off and to get rid of the mark of the beast. Stupid. Absolutely stupid. I don't care who taught it. It's stupid. And if you have that teaching out there, um, drop your pride and say, I, I was wrong to repeat that. That is stupid. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're not going to be in a medical you know, facility at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. They're, they won't even be around. I mean, they're going to be wiped out, no electric and whatever else, I'm sure. By the, by the time of the end of the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, people would call it the Great Tribulation, um, there's not going to be too much working anymore at that point in time. But you'd have to have the best doctors and everything else there. Okay, cut my hand off, you know, and then quickly fix it up and stuff. It's just, logically, it's just so stupid. But, um, but you can, can see why. These antichrists have to come out and say salvation has always been by faith alone and will always be by faith alone. Because then if you take the mark, well, hey, I'm still saved by faith alone. Okay? I have faith in Jesus and, and everything, and, and I, I, I took the mark, and you know, I'll, I'll get rid of it later on if I have to. And stupid heresy. And point number two, of course, ties in with this whole faith alone thing. And that is, they say, well, it's always, people have always had eternal security. They'll have eternal security in the tribulation. <laughs> okay, well, if you're saved by faith alone, uh, then yeah, you're eternally secure. You're in, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can take the mark, you can, you know, worship the beast in his image because you're eternally secure. You're just, you're a carnal Christian if you took the mark. <laughs> uh, I can easily show you that that's not true either. Hebrews chapter 10 and, you know, it's getting to the point now. I mean, you can take somebody to Revelation 14, verses 9 through 12, which shows works, an element of faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, and uh, go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 29, which we're going to be reading here. And, you know, these these people, there there's just no, the, the Spirit of God is not striving with these lost antichrists anymore. And they're just able to come up with some of the wildest explanations for this stuff and taking scriptures totally out of context. and you know. So I realize these scriptures can be used to answer somebody that still has some common sense in their head, but these people, common sense has left them a long time ago. But just to kind of answer, you know, give you answers if you're 
confused about these things. It's, if you're born again, you know, that's why I'm doing this study. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 29. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You say, oh, this is written to us? No, of course not. It's not written to a Christian. It's written to a Hebrew. Okay? Um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says there's neither Jew nor, nor Greek or Gentile. I can't think of how it goes. But there's in Christ, we're all one. You don't go around saying, I'm a Jewish Christian or I'm a, I'm a Gentile Christian. No, I'm a Christian. You see, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, not Jewish Christians, even though the disciples were all Jews at that point in time. They're in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Okay, um, so why would Paul write a book to the Hebrews? And I do believe firmly that it was Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews. Another issue. But uh, why would he write to the Hebrews? And uh, why would he write something that uh, would condemn every Christian that's ever lived. I mean, if you sin willfully, you know, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. How does that work for a Christian? You know, it doesn't. But how does it work for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble? You see? It's the time of Jacob's trouble, by the way. That's, you know, Jacob being Israel. Again, you got to get that thing. A lot of people don't understand that. That's why they come up with, they use the, ter the term Great Tribulation because it removes, you know, Daniel's 70th week. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. You know, Daniel chapter 9, upon Israel. And Jacob's time of Jacob's trouble, it's about Israel. The book of Hebrews written to the Jews because you see they don't believe in Jesus so they have to have the revelation of Jesus Christ. Confirm the New Testament by revealing who Jesus Christ is with the book of Revelation. You see, <laughs> that's what the whole thing's about, as I've preached many, many times. But what's going on here, here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27 is you have a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble and they're sinning willfully after they receive the knowledge of the truth. And I believe that that sin that they're doing is they're taking the mark of the beast. Okay? You say, I don't know about this. Let's keep reading. Verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. See the Jewish flavor there? Despised Moses' law? How much sore punishment punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy okay um he's talking to jews that are used to being under the law all right that's why you read through the book of hebrews he's saying about our fathers in the wilderness and and you know all these things like that he's talking to the jewish people not some gentile christian that that uh, i mean my ancestors didn't come out of egypt all right my ancestors are a bunch of you know Heathen uh, offspring from, you know, Japheth. Heathen meaning, you know, that they weren't, God wasn't using them throughout the Old Testament. So, but uh, again there you say, well, you know, we have eternal security. It's we're saved by faith alone. The Antichrist Christians will say that. We're saved by faith alone and we have eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, well, then somebody could take the mark. Easily. And that's what their agenda is, you see. These antichrists out there, be it in the new IFB or some of the others, little wing nuts on YouTube and things, they're really pushing this agenda. We've got to get this thing through of faith alone for salvation and eternal security in the future. Why? Because then when the time is right, then they can say, well, of course you have to take the mark. Of course. You get men like John MacArthur saying, yeah, there's no problem with taking the mark. Ken Hoven, yeah, I think you can take the mark. And these guys are coming out. That's what they're going to do. They're going to say, you're saved by faith alone. You have eternal security. Therefore, take the mark. You have to. You have no choice. They're servants of hell. Point number three that Antichrist Christians must teach. And that is you need to go to church. Even though that statement, go to church, appears nowhere in Scripture. Let me show you the importance of why they're saying that. 
what is the agenda that they have to get through. Revelation 13. And again, I've preached on this thing for years. This is just kind of a, might be new to somebody that's just found this video. Um, or just as a refresher to you, if you've been following this ministry for years. Revelation 13, verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Okay, uh, where do you worship at? Ask somebody that. Walk up to somebody on the street say, Do you worship anywhere? They're going to say a church. Oh, yeah, I go down to First Baptist Church over here. Or I, I go down to such and such Catholic Church over here. Or the Presbyterian, you know. Uh, yeah. They think church building. And, uh, well, this is the way the Christians have always done it. Um, well, actually, if you study church history, uh, church buildings really were not um, used by Christians, Bible-believing Christians, um, until after the Protestant Reformation. Most of them, you know, don't even date back 300 years. And now all of a sudden it's a requirement. You know, you need to be there. You need to be in church. You need to get yourself into a good New Testament local church. That's one of my favorite statements. You need to be part of a good New Testament local church. <laughs> uh, the term local church isn't even in the New Testament. Go to church is not in the New Testament. We're going to church. We're wearing our Sunday best. We're, you know, all this, this whole church structure thing comes from Roman Catholicism. And yet the Baptists, the IFBers will stand up there and they'll radically say, we, are, we do not come from Catholicism. We're not part of the Protestant Reformation. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Well, you know, Roger, Roger Smith and John Smythe and these, these old-time Baptists, they were, they were to, yeah, they didn't worship in church buildings either. They were radically against church buildings. The, the, the independent fundamental Baptist system is just, there are so many issues with that thing. And I've been in every type of the IFB type of church, the, the Bob Jones types, the Jack Hiles types, the Ruckman types, the... I've been in all these things, and they're just filled with problems, you know. But you see, Antichrist Christians have to get that thing pounded into people's heads to get you into a good church. Why? Well, because that's where people are going to be worshiping the Antichrist in a few years. After the body of Christ is called up, these church buildings are going to be used. I mean, why, why do you think the devil has been so busy building church buildings in every town for all these years. You say, oh, God, this is ridiculous. The devil's been building churches. I can't believe he said that. Okay, let me ask you a question then. Um, these church buildings, are they filled with saved people or lost people? Um, lost people. The average church building is filled with, with just wicked lost people. So who's really using these church buildings? And who's going to use them in the future? I mean, let's just assume for one minute that uh, all church buildings right now are filled with saved people. They're just carnal. <laughs> um, what do you think is going to happen to those church buildings when the body of Christ leaves? All Christians in all churches are gone, and they go up. You think the Antichrist is going to say, hey, I require worship of me, but don't you do it in the church buildings. You know, <laughs> this, this incredible nut David Cloud came out with this book against house churches, um, years ago, I did a video exposing it, um, and he was saying that the Antichrist system is going to be in house churches. <laughs> he was thinking, really? Seriously? Okay, yeah, all right, you know. Uh, people worshiping at home, that's how they're going to serve the Antichrist. Next, we're going to get a real controversial one here. The Antichrist Christians have to push a three-person trinity. Jesus is not the Father. They're not the same person. They both share the title God, and they both are one God, but they're not the same person. They've they got to do this thing. There's three God in three persons. Blessed, blasphemy. I mean, a, a trinity. You know, they got to do this thing. It's so, it's so important to them, you know. I mean, it's, it's some kind of it, it, this weird thing that it's a sin to not use a word or that that's, doesn't even appear in Scripture. Did I say that right? I think. You know, you have to say Trinity. You have to say God the Son, God the Spirit, three persons. You have to use this, all this language, this Trinitarian philosophical language. And if you don't, you're somehow in sin. You say, but it's not in the Bible. Yes, but it has to, you have to say these things. <laughs> 
Why is it so important? Why is this Trinitarian teaching so important to Antichrist Christians? Turn to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. You mean to tell me that there's going to be a trinity that the whole world is going to worship? What did we read earlier in Revelation 13? The whole world worships the dragon. The whole world, wor whole world worships the beast. And then the false prophet shows up after that. God in three persons. You see what I'm saying? If you want to convince people that are in the Catholic Church that the Christ in the future, the Antichrist, that he's God, well, then he'd need to show up with the other two members of the Trinity, wouldn't he? So you have uh, this Christ guy showing up the beast in reality, and there you have God the Son. And then this older man shows up, God the Father, the false prophet. And then you have this winged little, you know, angel, angelic winged being. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, I realize angels don't have wings, but the devil's also a, a dragon. You know, he's called the dragon, and he's able to come down and things. Oh, God the Holy Spirit. There's actually going to be a physical manifestation of a trinity, a three-person trinity in the future. That's why it's so important for Antichrist Christians to continually push their Trinitarian philosophy. Absolutely. Number five, the reprobate doctrine. What is so important about the reprobate doctrine? Why is that so important that the Antichrist Christians just have to preach it and preach it and preach it and preach it. Why? John chapter 16, verse 2. Turn there in your King James Bible. John chapter 16, verse 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Hmm. Um, the reprobate doctrine, if you're not familiar with it, if you haven't seen my other videos on it, the reprobate doctrine is a teaching primarily from the new IFB. Um, and they teach that there are certain people, sodomites mostly, you know, modern word would be homosexual, but they say that these people have been given over to a reprobate mind. They cannot get saved at any point in the future, even if they turn from their sin, even if they get convicted and say, I don't want this life anymore. Nope, sorry. You, you did these certain sins, so the blood of Jesus cannot forgive that. The, the Lord is just shocked by it. He, he, he doesn't understand how to forgive you, so he just turns you to a reprobate, reprobate mind, and you can't get saved. Well, see, that's the perfect teaching for a radical, flaming, antichrist papist. Because in the past, they had heretics and arch-heretics, those that were teaching, in other words. I'm one of those today, I'm sure. And... When you have somebody like this that refuses to recant, um, then you take them out and you burn them to death. First, you torture them a little bit, trying to, trying to really chasten their flesh, you see. So you just take them in and you torture them in your little inquisition chamber there, and you try to get them to recant of their heretical beliefs. And if they don't, well, then you have no mercy for them. And you take them out and you burn them at the stake, or you, you know, murder them. Uh, horribly and terribly. Well, because why? They're reprobate. You don't have to have any concern for them, you see. Um, and that's what Antichrist Christians need for the future. These Antichrists that call themselves Christians, they need this reprobate doctrine for people that won't take the mark of the beast. They'll say, you didn't mean to tell me you're not going to worship Christ? Christ is here. We've had the second coming. He's ruling and reigning on the earth now. And you're not going to you're going to side with those people that, that, that did all this horrible stuff that, that, that left, you know, and things or that, that disappeared, that blew themselves up or whatever they'll say about those that have been raptured. Um, you're going to side with them. And if the children go, you know, the, they'll say that, the, you know, 
people like me that are saved that we destroy the children somehow or something like this. You know, if the Lord catches the children up as well, you know, it'll be a, this terrible thing. And then the Antichrist will show up and he'll say, uh, you know, you have to worship me. And if, if you side with those evil people that did this horrible act, um, you should be killed. Well, see, they need that reprobate doctrine to be there. Because with the reprobate doctrine, then there's no need to have mercy for people that are your spiritual enemies. You see? You can just slaughter them. And what does the Antichrist do when he comes? He goes forth conquering and to conquer. And war is brought and peace is taken from the earth. Hmm. Finally, they have to be anti-pre-trib rapture. Antichrist Christians are all, they're just, you know, even people that once took stands for the pre-trib rapture, I'm seeing these Antichrists now and they're coming out and they're saying, actually, we'll be here to see the Antichrist. Um, we're, we're not going to be going up at before the tribulation. We're going to be there for the beginning of it now. We're going to go halfway through it. We're going to go a little bit through it. At some point in time, we'll be called up, but we have to be here to see the Antichrist because they can't rightly you know, just read plain English. The 24 elders are in heaven and a great multitude of angels in the resurrection, whereas the angels of God, you know, they're there in Revelation chapter 5 before chapter 6 where the first seal is open and the Antichrist is unleashed. They can't just read that. Oh, oh well, no. It's, you see, um, they have to twist 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 all around, which I've done studies to refute that whole messed up teaching that, you know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you can look that whole thing up there. But my whole point is, they have to go against the pre-trib rapture, these Antichrist Christians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's look at the probably the greatest passage on the catching up. I realize pre-trib rapture is not the term in the scriptures, I understand that, but you know, it's what most people think of. So that's what, I, you know, I'll say it just to prove the point here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the resurrection, in other words. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Um... It's a comfort to look forward to seeing Jesus Christ. It's not a comfort to say, well, first we've got to see the Antichrist. First we're going to go through some really, really bad times and whatever else. And, you know, uh, yeah, the Antichrist is going to show up first. That's not a comfort, okay? We're to wait for Jesus, not the Antichrist. And let me just say it this way. Um, when's the rapture going to happen? I want the day, I want the hour, and I want the minute. Can you tell me? You say, well, no, nobody knows that. Um, how about if uh, it's three and a half years after the Antichrist shows up and confirms that covenant? Now you can kind of time it out, can't you? Mm -hmm. See, again, the, the problem there with these Antichrist Christians? You see, if the Antichrist shows up first, then you can time out when we're going to be leaving. You see? But as a Christian, you're waiting for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You say, hey, I really don't know when he's going to catch us up. You know, it may be at noon. It may be at twilight. It may be, or it may be perchance, at the blackness of midnight. Well, don't sing that song anymore. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long? Can't even think of how the song goes right now. <laughs> Wasn't in my notes. But, you know, don't sing that. Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. No, don't, don't, don't sing that. Antichrist cometh, oh no, oh no, we're in trouble, you know. <laughs> sing it that way, just change the lyrics a little bit, update it, you know, like a good Antichrist would do. Um, no, we're supposed to have comfort that Jesus Christ is going to be the one that we see next. Not the Antichrist. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Hmm. For when they, 
I've talked about this for years and years. There, there's distinction here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Ye, you, talking to saved people. They, them, you see, talking to lost people. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Antichrist post-tribbers are not going to escape. It's so funny, they're actually prophesying their own future. Uh, we're, not, I'm, we're not going up in the rapture. We're going to be here for the tribulation. Yeah, you most certainly are. <laughs> you know? Sorry. Uh, posties are going to be here. It's because... Uh, their God is a God that's, that uh, needs to put them through for, further purification in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation. So yeah, they got to be here for that. Um, my Savior, my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ paid for everything on the cross. And um, the works that I do today are for the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, my works are going to get judged there and I'll be rewarded accordingly. Um, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And uh, you say, well, what if everybody turn, turns against that? What if nobody else stands for it? <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to keep standing for it because I know it's the truth. So uh, watch out for those six teachings. Um, if you hear somebody teaching that stuff, um, you know, faith alone, uh, there's no such scripture that says faith alone. Uh, faith, if, you ha if you're saved by your faith alone, um, then it's you that does the saving. You're removing God's grace. Salvation today is grace through faith. Okay? It is not faith alone. It's never going to be faith alone. Okay? Um, eternal security in every dispensation. Another one of the lies that these antichrists will teach. Uh, you're not going to have eternal security in the future. You have eternal security today, today certainly. Absolutely. Uh, I've preached on that many times. Um, but in the future, in the time of Jacob's trouble, somebody goes into that time period, you take that mark, you lose the salvation that you have. You have to endure to the end to be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Um, the third one there, I've got to look at my list again. Third one there is you need to go to church. Um, be careful about these people that try to insist that you're not right with God if you're not going to a local church someplace. Um, find Christians to fellowship with. That's absolutely fine. But when they have some building that they're calling the church and you have to dress a, a different way to go there and whatever else and, and things, I'd be real careful about that. Uh, there's no New Testament teaching there. There's, no, there's nothing in the New Testament, in other words, it says to do that. And when you look at what the reality of it is, it's just setting up these little worship centers for the Antichrist you know, in every town. Um, another thing to watch out for. Um, number four, watch out for Antichrist Christians that teach a three-person trinity. Uh, there are Christians that, that believe the right thing about the Godhead and use try to, they get messed up with, uh, they get spoiled through philosophy and they try to say, um, God the Son or God the Spirit or, or you know, Trinity or I'm a Trinitarian. You know, have some grace for, for Trinity people. I do have grace for some people out there that believe in the Trinity um, because they're, they're, when you, you actually talk to them about what they believe, who Jesus Christ is, and, they, and you realize oh, they actually believe in the Godhead of Scripture, but they're just confused. They've been spoiled with this Trinitarian philosophy. And it, the Trinitarian thing is a philosophy. You know, all the Trinity teaching, it's philosophical in its origin. Again, the catechism, Catholic catechism is honest about that. They say it's of philosophical origin. Um, so you know, have some grace for them. But if you see some, one of these people that just radically, vehemently insists that Jesus is not the Father and, and all this other stuff, um, you're dealing with a Antichrist there. Um, number five, the reprobate doctrine. I would run away from anybody that believes the reprobate doctrine. Um, I believe the, you know, the scriptures teach that anybody can get saved. Uh, the, you know, the old hymn goes, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. You know, yeah. 
Uh, I teach that Jeffrey Dahmer got saved after he went to prison. Um, I studied that thing in, in great detail, in fact, read the book of the pastor who went in and counseled Jeffrey Dahmer. And it's ironic because I don't think the pastor was saved, but Jeffrey Dahmer definitely was. I don't have a, a question in my mind about that man getting saved. And um, just a really amazing testimony that the guy had after, you know, coming to the Lord as a sinner. He was finally broken. He believed in evolution because he went to public school. And that's what made him think that he wasn't accountable to anybody. There's a lot of people out there that are like that. And if you're out there and you, you're just living very wickedly and you've done some very vile things and you've looked at some very vile things and been part of some very vile things, the Lord will forgive you no matter what you've done. The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you from anything. Okay? Can't continue that lifestyle. The Lord's going to clean you up. Absolutely. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. There's going to be some major changes that are going to occur. Sure. Uh, it'd be point, kind of pointless to get saved if He didn't change your life. But um, this reprobate doctrine thing, just looking and seeing people that are in sodomy and whatever else, so I, I don't have to witness to them. Jesus' blood can't take that sin away. That's a problem. And the final conclusion of that is that you have somebody that's called a reprobate or in Catholicism an arch heretic or heretic or whatever, no sympathy at all for that person. You can kill them. The time will come when they that kill you will think that they do God's service. That's talking about in the future, in this time of Jacob's trouble. And finally, number six, you have people that are against the pre-trib rapture or the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, that's one of the most important things for Antichrist Christians to get through. Um, because, see, when the catching up actually happens, then they can say, that wasn't the rapture. That's not the rapture. We know from Scripture that the, there's no pre-trib rapture. You know, it's, 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 that wasn't the rapture. It was some kind of a thing. These people committed suicide or they, they did some kind of a whatever. They have to get these uh, different things through. Uh, they have to teach this stuff. So um, I'd run away from ministries that, that are really, really hardcore on this stuff. Um, just it's, it's just getting insane out there. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I check up on other channels and things and check up on what people are teaching, and I'm just seeing this, these antichrists out there, and they're, they're just so, uh, you know, they, they just have to get these different, these six things, they have to get them through, uh, have to get them taught. So, uh, I pray for you, brethren. I really do. I pray every night for the supporters of this ministry and the friends of this ministry. Um, it just, the, the attacks that are coming and the people that are falling away that once stood for correct doctrine, um, they're being made manifest, as we read in, in 1 John chapter 2. These antichrists are, are the Lord is, is manifesting who they are. And, um, you know, I know I've, I've read a lot of different accounts of war and, and things and soldiers and their stories and autobiographies and things, you know, going into war. And, and a lot of these guys just said, I don't want to become friends with anybody because at any time my, my best friend that I've made there, they can get killed, killed in action. And I, don't, I just don't want to emotionally attach myself to anybody. <laughs> and, you know, I feel like that sometimes myself as a Christian in these end times, you know, you... You hate to attach yourself emotionally to people because the, they turn out to be antichrists and, and, you know, all of a sudden there's some kind of a doctrinal thing shows up, boom, comes up and they turn and they start stabbing you in the back and, and all of a sudden they, they're erasing all the stands that they used to take and they're going and they're joining your enemies and you're thinking, what in the world? Um, you have to get your love for the Lord as your main priority and your love and and uh, respect for this book um, needs to be there that needs to be number one priority in your life and uh, it doesn't matter who turns against the Lord or who turns against the Bible um, if you have that mindset of I'm gonna stand by the Lord no matter what happens it's still gonna be rough but you know you're not gonna you're not gonna be tempted to fall away from the Lord 
So just just need to say that because it, it's really getting insane out there. And, um, you know, I've, I've had to come out against ministries and things that I normally would have supported just because I, I can't trust them. You know, um, you know, Charles Lawson, uh, I'll just say this, you know, I got I've gotten so much, you know, kickback from my thing of coming out and rebuking Lawson for his, you know, saying that Constantine was a saved man. I mean, it just, you know, the founder of Roman Catholicism was not a saved man. Okay, the guy was a, a wicked pagan. And for Lawson to come out and say that he believes he was a saved man, I mean, that, that is a major, major problem. And I mean, if he says that in front of his, his church congregation, they need to stay, say, yeah, brother, you know, that's, that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't say that kind of a thing. And it, should, it certainly should not be put on YouTube. It should not be put out there. I mean, what are, what are Catholics going to think? You get some guy that's supposed to be a King James Bible-believing pastor, and he comes out and he says, Constantine was a saved man. The Catholic's going to say, well, then why am I leaving my system? Constantine founded my system. Why would I leave it? You know, I um, don't really know what else to say. It just, it's just, it's frustrating. So... But thankfully, we have a perfect Savior, and He gave us a perfect standard right here, King James Bible. So, stand, brethren. And don't fall for these uh, wicked liars that are coming out, these antichrists that are coming out and um, trying to draw you away from the truth. Okay? So, that is going to be it, and we'll see you in the next video.